Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Stantec Water Webinar Series. We are pleased to present Simon Horsley, our North American Distribution System Water Quality Leader, who is speaking on design and operation of chlorinated water systems. I am Heather Dean, your hostess. During this meeting, you will be in listen-only mode. We invite you to submit questions at any time during the presentation. If you're joining via computer, you can do so by expanding the questions box in the side panel of your screen. If you're on a mobile device, click the question mark located at the top of your screen. Your questions will be addressed following the presentation. And with that, Simon, I will kick it over to you to get us started. Thank you, Heather, and welcome everybody. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna be talking all about chlorines today. And we're gonna be starting from the bottom up, uh, discussing the, the very basics, what chloramines are, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about some considerations of how we design chloraminated systems, how we run our water systems that are chloraminated, and some of the sort of monitoring things we think about to make sure that those systems run right. Um, my background with Stantec, uh, I've been here for 15 years, and in that time, I really I do a fair amount of process work and our treatment plants, but I've really, really focused on distribution system water quality. So I've been working with uh, utilities, running chloraminated systems, and troubleshooting those systems for, for over 15 years now. So I hope to share a few of those experiences today. This is a sort of broad strokes what we're gonna be covering today. Um, I'm going to start with a brief, uh, very chloramine specific safety moment. Um, and, and then we'll do a brief introduction to the topic. I'm going to, I guess I broke this down into what we might call the chemistry and the biology, not that we're going to be going into any great chemistry. But I guess the chemistry piece is going to talk about some of the things we think about really in the treatment plant and some aspects out there in our distribution systems. And the biology piece is really going to be taking a look at what happens out there in our distribution systems. There's some interesting biology that happens. So we'll get talking about that. I'm going to sort of briefly illustrate uh, some of the monitoring considerations through by way of a case study. Um, and then we will we'll wrap up with, with Q&A. And I hope to leave a good amount of time um, and certainly encourage some, some good discussion at the end of this. So a very chloramine-centric safety moment here, which relates to the accidental blowing up of the roof of a water treatment plant uh, in my home province of Ontario, in Canada. Um, I guess just a, a brief note that what we're going to be talking about adding two big ingredients, chlorine and ammonia, or chloramines. Um, uh, we should remember that uh, while these things do very well in drinking water, these nice low concentrations and neat chemical form as delivered, they do not mix well. Uh, this particular plant had all kinds of safety precautions in place to, to delineate and separate chlorine and ammonia. They had a bit of bad luck in that the usual truck driver, the, the, the post-incident investigation showed, was not available. Uh, a stand-in truck driver arrived and uh, with the chlorine uh, solution, and uh, although there was, that was tagged out, color-coded, incompatible uh, connection to the, uh, to the ammonia tank, nonetheless, somehow through some ingenuity, managed to get that, that chlorine uh, connected to the ammonia tank, an error uh, pumped the chlorine into the, into the ammonia tank, uh, reported what he described as a very loud version of stomach rumbling coming from the building and, and quite rightly, um, ran away uh, just as the building uh, blew up, uh, taking the roof out with it, and actually went to that site shortly afterwards 
and the, uh, the, the door from the chemical room had ricocheted down the corridor a 90 degree turn, continued to ricochet and finally planted itself into yet another door. So um, a very practical example of what we're often told in chemistry textbooks, chlorine and ammonia do not mix in context of, of chemical storage. So with that safety moment out of the way, um, I'm going to start with just a very basic intro to sort of what I hope to get out of, what I hope you might take from this, uh, this webinar. Uh, if you're anything like me and you, you go along to a conference or attend a webinar, there can be a lot of information. If the information is somewhat new, then it can be challenging to absorb all of that information. Um, so what I really hope is that you'll take away just some of the key issues here and maybe, you know, if, if either the design of a chlorominated system should come along in the future or should some aspect of running a chlorominated system come along in the future that you might recollect something. Was, was there something about pH maybe I ought to be thinking about at the plant? And maybe something about mixing, et cetera, and that some of these things might come back and that maybe you will either revisit the, uh, the webinar um, or, or go and look at some of the excellent resources out there. But I do wanted to plant in your mind just a few key ideas that we're going to focus on today. This is a wide ranging subject. Um, we, we can and do fill textbooks with it. Uh, so I'll just be touching on what I hope are some of the key, really sort of practically driven considerations at design and operating level. And I hope some of those will, will stay with you. So first of all, a sort of very brief primer before we get into, and we will get into how we make chloramines, what that process looks like, what does it look like to actually create these things at a treatment plant, standing back for a moment, why do we use chloramines at all? What are chloramines? We really disinfect our distribution system networks in one of two ways. We're either adding chlorine, just straight chlorine, uh, or we are using these things called chloramine, which is chlorine with just a little dash of, of ammonia added. Again, we'll come back to that in a little more detail. So it's an alternative form of residual disinfectant. That is to say the disinfectant residual we're adding that will stay in the water and keep that water safe throughout the network once it leaves the treatment plant right through to customer taps. About 20% of the US right now drinks chlorinated water. This is, this is a very common method of disinfection. And those systems are largely big urban sort of systems. You would have San Francisco and Washington, Denver, uh, Toronto, where I live. Lots of large uh, systems are running on chloramines. And they've been around for a while. Uh, Denver was the first utility to implement chloramines in, in, in North America back in the 1920s. So we have over 100 years of practical experience in using chloramines, and yet our knowledge is still very much growing on the use of chloramines. And, uh, sorry, no, 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 we're here. and they're a very stable disinfectant residual. It's one of the main reasons that they're, they're very popular. It's a stable disinfectant residual, generally decays. We're going to look at this in a bit more detail. It generally decays slower than the chlorinated system. So for big urban systems, big networks, want to keep the chlorine in the water for longer distances, it can be a really good option. And there's some other, uh, some other good aspects as well. Another major aspect is that following ammonia addition, once we form chloramines, we effectively uh, stop any further formation of halogenated disinfection byproducts, so THMs, HAs, so the systems that can have elevated DBPs, regulated DBPs. This is yet another driver 
or using chloramines to prevent further growth of those things out there in the network. So lots of good benefits in using chloramines a long time, lots of people using chloramines right now. Well, let's take a look at those claims a little bit closer. I guess what I've just given is the, the sort of billboard version. But like any billboard, um, we need to take a look at, at some of the fine print that goes with that. We take a look at this. I rather like this, this, um, this sort of internet sign. So we had, you know, $49, $49 a month each for 12 months. And then, and then we get thinking about this a little bit more. We say, so hang on, is it, is it in fact $49.99? Or are we saying it's $99.98 for both of these things? Or what does that little from mean exactly? And furthermore, what happens after 12 months? It doesn't, it doesn't seem to say. So when we take a closer look, you know, a few questions start to creep into our minds. And there's something analogous, I think, with chloramines. We have these long lasting residuals, but there's a little bit of fine print and we're gonna get into this in a little more detail. The residuals may drop fast if we don't have the water quality right, if the pH in particular is overly low, as we'll talk about and some other conditions. If these things called nitrifying bacteria. We'll come back to that. If that's a new term or something that's a little distant in your mind, we'll come back and, and take a look at that in a moment. But if these things start to start to grow out in the distribution system, that can cause us some problems as well. And yes, we gen, you know, we can we can stop further halogenated DBPs forming, but turns out with a little bit more research that we actually can form some other types of DBPs, these nitrogenous DBPs. I see overall less common, but worth noting. And we can also, uh, another benefit of, of, of chloramine, monochloramine, as we'll talk about, is that it has a higher taste node threshold. So generally less detectable to, to residents out there and drinking water. So relative to chlorine, that's a great thing, but that's not a guarantee. Chloramines can become, uh, we can get a really strong chlorinous odor if we don't quite get the chemistry right. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. So can chloramines deliver all these benefits? I think absolutely. Um, but there are some considerations here. And we do need to be mindful of the boundaries under which they, they work well. And we have to sort of police those, those boundaries, both at the plant and out there in the distribution system. And we'll talk about those things. So starting on the, the chemistry side, so this is a really thinking more about what happens in the plant and then how that sort of affects things. Once that water leaves the plant, that parcel of water leaves the plant and starts to make its way through the distribution system and ultimately you know, maybe to, to a tap. Okay, so starting with how do we make chloramines? Um, pretty straightforward. If, if we wanted to do make our own chloramines at home, we would we'd get a beaker of water, say distilled water, just to make the conversation easier. And we would effectively add equal parts of chlorine and ammonia. For those who like this stuff, that's one mole of each or one, one molecule of each, if you like, one molecule of, of, of chloride to, to ammonia. And we mix well. And with, within a few seconds, if we mix that nicely, we're going to get this nice solution of stuff called monochloramine, mono one. So one chlorine to one ammonia, one of each will form. And that's our, that's, that's our disinfectant, very simple. And then of course we start getting into some of the fine print, why these things are never quite as simple. Chloramines, the, the chlorine, the coupling of chlorine and ammonia, it's not a completely stable reaction. They're actually sort of coming together and coming undone a little bit and then coming together again and so on. And so not completely stable, but the majority will come back together again. So for all intents and purposes, we, we typically have all this chloramine. But through that process, sometimes we lose a little bit of the, these common coupled 
and the chlorine doesn't, the chloride at this point doesn't doesn't go back and join in with the ammonia. It just kind of it spins off and joins the chloride concentration of that water. And what's left is the ammonia. What that means is that over time, if we were just to again think about we've just made our, our one liter of water in our in our kitchen with some distilled water, some chlorine and ammonia. If we were to leave that over time, we would see, if we look on the left here, these, these graphs, we would see the chlorine start to come down. And that's through this process. Even, the even in the absence of any demand, et cetera, you know, over time, we will start to lose chloramine residual um, due to this, this, uh, this process of disproportionation. And as the chlorine comes down, if we were to keep on measuring that periodically in our kitchen, well, we could we could also measure the ammonia, and we would see the ammonia rise, um, in a sort of mirror image of the total chlorine coming down. So, you know, once the once this chlorine leaves, thinking back now from the kitchen to the back to the distribution system, once we have a nice parcel of water leaving the plant, nice healthy residual, that parcel travels long enough. Maybe it goes into a storage tower, hangs out there for a while carries on into the network. If it, if it travels there long enough, that, that parcel of water will gradually accumulate um, free ammonia. It's just going to slowly accumulate. And if you really measured it very carefully, you'd also see that it increases a little bit in chloride as well, correspondingly. But it's the ammonia bit we're most interested in for reasons that we'll come to in a moment. Um, this, this is... I, for me, this is quite an important um, little concept. I, I, I've tried to pull this together into a figure, which I created using the, the excellent um, EPA freeware software, which is referenced in the bottom right here, and which you can you can dive on to, to Google there and look this thing up and get access to this excellent um, piece of software, which has been put out by EPA, very user friendly, and you can you can play around with different water quality conditions. And it will, it will give you um, some sort of theoretical projected uh, chloramine residual trends over time. And then this figure I made up by doing a whole bunch of trials and sort of patching it together. So it's expressing just a couple of things here that have a really important impact on monochloramine. So the first is pH. And you can see that down the sort of bottom right of that figure. Now, of course, the, we could have extended on the pH to 8, 8.2, 8.4, et cetera. But this is kind of where things get interesting, which is why I've, I've chosen it. It's pretty flat lined above about 7.8. But under about 7.8, you can see that the percent monochloramine starts to drop down. And once we get under, say, pH 7, it starts to drop down quite precipitously there, drops down quite a lot. And on the other axis there, down the very bottom, we've got this thing here, chlorine to nitrogen ratio. So I said that you need one chlorine and one ammonia, and you sort of stick those together and you get this monochloramine. Well, that one of each is, is one molecule of each, one mole of each. But when we're thinking about dosing, treatment plants, we often think in weight, milligrams, a liter, that's how we like to think about things. So we think about it in terms of weight, it's, um, it's about uh, the perfect sort of ratio is about, about five to one uh, chlorine to nitrogen ratio, just because chlorine weighs about five times more. So it's about one to one as molecules. But you can go a little bit lower than that. So if we go lower, that means we've got a little bit of extra ammonia, or we can go higher than that, which means we've got a little bit of extra chlorine, if you like. And you can see that these, these two things, pH, chlorine to nitrogen ratio, they, they sort of interact and they give us this, this low point, which corresponds to low pH and, and too much chlorine, chlorine to nitrogen ratio. And on the left-hand axis, I've got the sort of percent monochloramine. Now, chloramine, it's really a sort of a collective term, but what we're trying to create and what we generally have in distribution systems, for the most part, is, is monochloramine, one chlorine, uh, one ammonia. When we get too much chlorine, then we start to get these things called dichloramine, 
So instead of monochloramine, one chlorine, we get dichloramine. We now get two chlorines latching onto an ammonia. And that stuff, dichloramine, is a big problem. We're going to talk about that a little bit more as well when we come to the biology piece. And the problem with dichloramine is, so there's a few problems with it, but two of the main problems with dichloramine are number one, it actually gets in, involved in some reactions whereby it degrades the monochloramine. So water is going to have some, some monochloramine, it's going to have some dichloramine, We're trying to minimize that dichloramine fraction. And the more that's there, the more it's going to participate in this decay of monochloramine. So that water is going to start to decay faster and faster, the more dichloramine is there. That's one problem with dichloramine. Another thing with dichloramine is that it smells dreadful. <laughs> it sort of has a very distinct swimming pool type of an odor. So when I said earlier in the fine print, you know, monochloramine has this nice high taste odor threshold. So we, we don't tend to get too, uh, we tend to get less odor complaints, say, relative to having to use uh, regular free chlorine. Um, that sort of presupposes that we've got things nicely tweaked and that we're running with a high, very high fraction monochloramine. It doesn't take an enormous amount of dichloramine before we start getting into chlorinous taste and odor complaints. So these are two things to think about back at the plant that have an impact out there in the distribution system. At what pH are we making our chloramines? And do we get that, that ratio right? Now, the ratio part, we've got a good level of control over that. You know, we're dosing the ammonia. We can choose to turn it up, turn it down. We can select a set point here. But um, it's, it's notable that if that set point is off, let's say we think we're getting the right set point, but there's a little error somewhere within our, our process control narrative, and we're a little high, well, that's going to manifest. That might be one of the things that could manifest as a higher rate of, of decay and a higher fraction of dichloramine. So enough about that, I think. pH, chlorine to nitrogen ratio, those are the two. Two big takeaways, I think, on the, the treatment side. So these are the translating this into, you know, choosing those boundary conditions. Is the pH right? And effectively, the higher the better. And if the pH is under about seven, it's or anywhere near say seven, it's going to be a much higher rate of decay. I know systems, uh, City of Ottawa would be an example here in Ontario, run their pH up over nine, or some other reasons related to corrosion control, but that will produce a dead stable monochloramine, a very high fraction of monochloramine. I know other systems running closer to seven, and we see some of those other challenges. So pH matters. As I mentioned on the ammonia dosing, not just a question of selecting the right set point, but then making sure the equipment logic and, and just the mechanics of how that's delivered is actually giving you what you want there. Uh, one thing that sometimes comes up is, is groundwater um, chlorination and the question of, well, we have this ammonia and it might be rather expensive to remove it. So why don't we just turn our chlorine into chloramines? We'll get some UV, manage um, disinfection, majority of disinfection, and we can, we can just form chloramines. And in some cases that might work. But we really draw attention to this importance of this chlorine to nitrogen ratio, first of all. And the second thing is, and this is more often the case, what happens if you have way more ammonia than you need? You'll form your chloramine, but you're going to have some extra ammonia left over. And we'll talk about that in a moment when we come to talk about the biology piece. And lastly is this mixing thing. And actually, I want to talk about that in the next slide here. When we dose the ammonia, at a, let's say we're go opting for what's one of the more common ratios, a four to one ratio, it gives a very small excess of free ammonia, uh, which can be stabilizing. So that's a typical dosing ratio, four to one. We add that into, well, if we think about a sort of a one liter cube or parcel of water, um, if that mixing is not terribly well enacted when we add the ammonia, we, we might get something like what we see in the right here, kind of a, a slug, if you like, 
of, of high concentration ammonia at the point of addition, and that's going to move out gradient fashion. Um, and so that, that when we think about that in terms of the uh, ratio, we're going to have a, a very, very low ratio, chlorine to nitrogen ratio within that gray box. We've got lots of ammonia. And, and then we're going to move through all the various gradations until we maybe get to the extremities of this sort of box. And there we might have much higher chlorine to nitrogen ratios. And so in the middle, we might have we like an excess of ammonia, if we want to think of it that way. And the extremities, you might have a shortfall in ammonia. Now, does that matter? How much does that really matter? Does it play out in reality when we say, well, we like to have everything distributed nicely? Well, it, it, it does play out in reality. This was some jar uh, testing we, we, we did uh, about a year and a half ago now, in which we introduced ammonia at the dose uh, that this particular utility was using with no mixing versus um, some other uh, different levels of mixing. And uh, with no mixing, this is what we'd expect to happen, is, is what did happen. We can see the monochloramine and the, uh, the y-axis here. This is the percent monochloramine. So when that goes down, that means the balance is, is really largely this dichloramine stuff that's, that's forming. So when we get poor mixing at the point of mixture, even days later, we're still seeing that effect. You know, we've had diffusion to act all of that time, but we're still seeing that sort of hangover from the original, from the original dosing issue. And, and there's, there's some, some literature out there that takes a look at this, that it seems to be something we're seeing increasingly is, is, is thinking about making sure we get a proper mix at the ammonia. Many times that's taken care of in many, many uh, plants, no problems there. But again, if we're troubleshooting, if we're trying to figure out, I've been doing some measuring out there, some monitoring, I've got this dichloramine stuff filling up and it's causing me a problem. Well, this is one of the avenues of investigation, I think, is to have a look at the, at the mixing, one of the several avenues of investigation. But does it play out in reality? Yeah, yes, it does. Okay, so that, that's enough about the, the chemistry side. Now we're going to get into something which I think we don't often get into <laughs> as an industry, which is thinking on a little bit on the biology side. We often like our, our chemistry. Um, more, but there's some interesting biology that happens here. Um, if you're wondering if this is an image of a real nitrifying bacteria, yes, it is. Yes, it is. You would never think of something as silly as a, as a made up bacteria with a smiley face. Um, so, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the specific um, nitrifier bacteria in a moment. We're talking generically for a minute. What do bacteria like to eat in general? They generally like, they can like a bunch of other things as well, but a sort of core, core diet for bacteria are, are three things, which when I first learned them back in school, this is how I recalled it, think pink, and it still works for me today. So phosphorus, nitrogen, and carbon. And these ratios move around depending on which, uh, which type of bacteria we're thinking about, but sort of in the aggregate, if we had to choose an average, roughly at a one to 10 to 100 ratio. So they need lots of carbon and they like quite a lot of nitrogen and they like a little bit of phosphorus in general, generically speaking. So let's have a think now. Um, what about that ammonia that we talked about before? This is one of the other ones we had the the corresponding chart with the, the chlorine going down and this ammonia forming. What happens to all of that ammonia? It will generally do one of two things. It's either going to simply accumulate there in the water, go to the end of the network, you could grab a sample, and there it is. And it's not really doing any harm there. It's, uh, it's just along for the ride. Um, alternatively, it can be food. It can be food for bacteria. And, you know, Following sort of Darwinian principles, if we if we feed a system a particular type of bacteria, then that type of the type of bacteria that like to eat that food are going to thrive and they're going to become predominant. 
And if you're wondering why we are looking at some goats huddling to the side of a cliff, it's because I, I rather like this as a sort of a, it's, it sort of puts me in mind of, of biofilm on the side of a pipe. And if you've ever looked under, you know, an SEM scanning electron microscope or, or something at bacteria and what they look like, it's all, it was surprising to me anyway, the first time that I saw even something like a PVC pipe under an SEM and you realize these are not smooth surfaces. They're full of striations. They're full of crevices. And, and, and then of course, when we move to something more like a cement lined you know, AC all the way through to something like cast, um, you know, these, these walls of these pipes and tanks are, are, are not even remotely smooth at the level at which bacteria are living. They are, they're really vented, they're full of crevices, they're full of all kinds of things. And so much like these goats, we, 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 we can find life starts to grab onto these precarious footholds and starts to, and starts to thrive, and starts to grow. And as we said, if, if we take a system, now biofilm is going to be in any system, whether you notice it or not, this, any system has biofilm, effectively. Um, certainly any drink and water system does. Um, but if we, if we start feeding that system a diet high in nitrogen, then we're going to start to get proliferation of bacteria that like to eat nitrogen. And this is what we get. If we, if we start pushing ammonia into that system, there's a bunch of bugs who just like to eat ammonia, these ammonia oxidizing bacteria, and they will start to show up. Just them, you know, within a community, there's the, the biofilm is full of all kinds of different species, but these little, these little blue guys are going to start to appear to begin with, you know, patchy. Let's say we just started introducing chloramines, you know, last week, but over the course of months and years, we're going to start to see, you know, these kind of blue, if you like, bacteria starting to colonize and starting to grow wherever bacteria like to grow, places with low flow, low, low velocity, shear force, Low chlorines, these are the warm temperatures, these are the spots that bacteria generically like, and nitrifying bacteria are no different. So, a system that has an excess of ammonia, that little residual of ammonia, we start to get these ammonia oxidizing bacteria growing. And they produce as a metabolic byproduct the nitrite. Well, if the system gets up and going enough, that we're, you know, we've got lots of this sort of blue, if you like, bacteria, these ammonia oxidizing bacteria, then we start to see lots of nitrite in the system. And after a while, those first sort of early colonizers, those ammonia oxidizers, they create an environment under which nitrite oxidizing bacteria can now, can now appear. And they in turn oxidize that nitrite, turn it into nitrate. So now we've got these two different, but interdependent, or certainly the nitrite oxidizers dependent on the ammonia oxidizers. We have these two different species starting to sprout up and, and, and become quite dominant within chloraminated water systems. So that's, that can happen. And so we form these colonies um, within our water systems. And, you know, uh, this is a, a, a Water Research Foundation number, but about two thirds of kind of medium large chloraminated systems experience some, some degree of nitrification. Now, that is to say detectable. I think I'd argue that every system has some degree, but the extent to which it starts to show up at the limits of detection on our analyzers, um, handheld analyzers, about, about two thirds. So this is a fairly common, fairly common sort of a, a thing that can happen. Um, why do we care about that? There were other bacteria there before in our, our, our little system. We said if we start to introduce chloramines, then the excess ammonia means we start to get these other type of bacteria. Well, is it a wash? One type of bacteria, another type of bacteria. Okay, they're oxidizing the ammonia. What's the big deal? Well, they, as it happens, it is a big deal. Um, that nitrite that is produced, nitrite goes and starts its own reactions independent of the bacteria, it will go and start to degrade monochloramine at a sort of, a sort of one to one molar ratio there. So when nitrite shows up, it starts to participate in decay reactions with monochloramine. And in the process, also spins off some free ammonia, by the way. So that, that those, those ammonia oxidizing bacteria are, create a little micro environment around them where they are producing nitrite. The nitrite helps to degrade the monochloramine, 
bacteria are also doing what bacteria like to do and, and you know, producing extracellular polymeric sort of sticky protective substances, which are also decaying monochloramine. So suddenly the rate of, of monochloramine decay can start to really ramp up relative to sort of regular bugs. And we start to see this. Um, other bacteria will also proliferate in parallel because they've now got a sort of a safe haven in around this area if we get nitrification happening. And we'll see epitrophic plate counts, fairly generic means of, of looking at um, bacteriological um, quantity. And for those who, who are familiar, a ATP, adenosine triphosphate monitoring as well, which is just a, a generic way of looking at, at all biological activity, independent of whether it's bacteriological or anything else. So we start to see these things which look at overall sort of, you know, biological activity, all those markers start to go up and up. That's when we start, one of the reasons we start to know we've got a problem. We see nitrite go up, as we'd expect, because our, our bacteria are now producing nitrite. And we see nitrate uh, start to go up as well as that secondary uh, oxidation product. And ammonia is a bit trickier because ammonia kind of goes up which creates the conditions for nitrification to begin, but then it can also start to come down as it starts to get eaten up as food. So ammonia will often be maybe a little high, and then we'll see a dip. So these things, which are these, these, these sort of five bullets, there are other things that happen as well, um, but these are really the major indicators, and they're all very logical. These are all the things which spin off from the process we just talked about, those bugs. So decreasing chlorine, more and more biological activity, you know, biological markers, nitrite starts to sneak up within, you know, these are the types of ranges shown in brackets, uh, nitrite, nitrate, and a bit of decreasing ammonia. So just the last piece of, of this, this webinar uh, before we turn over to Q&A um, uh, 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 is a case study. And really just looking, really just case study as a means to look at how we might think about some of that data how we how we might see it what does it really look like so that's all very conceptual we've talked about so far so this particular system which i'll just speak about in the generic um sort of community you know sort of city city up north uh, and then a secondary city in the south supplied by a couple of surface plants in the north also a few wells here and the city was seeing uh, some, some challenges with chlorine residual maintenance, chloramine residual maintenance. And within the last few years, decided to, to begin some, some monitoring. Uh, let's, let's start looking for these, some of these things. We, we understand this is best practice stuff. So let's, let's start gathering some data, seeing if we can understand if some of this chlorine loss we're seeing, is it just plain old water age or do we have something else going on here? So we, we had a bit of a look at the plant, uh, chlorine and ammonia, you know, some of that stuff we talked about uh, at the beginning of this, this webinar. Have a look at some of the data, looking for trends. That's the bit that I really want to focus on at the moment. Figure out what's our, what's our root cause or causes here contributing to chlorine decay. And then as any good nitrification plan should uh, provide very practical Sort of operations driven solutions to bring those trends back and check when they start to show up. So first of all, I'm reading the data. It's very common, I think, for systems to be collecting, whether it's nitrification related or other aspects of water quality, to be collect collecting data in databases. And it can be very hard. You know, a lot of our regulatory criteria, sort of binary pass fail stuff. Um, and so, you know, if, if a number comes in above or below a certain threshold value, that becomes the trigger for action. Nitrification is a bit trickier because we are really looking for trends. And those trends might be well within regulatory limits. Um, what, is an, what is a higher trend for one system might be a more typical number for another system. So we're less focused on absolute numbers generally, and we're more interested in, in trends. So when we think about strings of numbers, numbers and tables, et cetera, it can be kind of hard to read these. So when we open up an Excel sheet and we've got all our sampling data there, it's very hard to read what we're seeing. It really helps when we take numbers and start to trend them 
we are much better as, as humans at dealing with visual information. We can get a lot of nuance out of this curve. What, what is steep, what area just about flat lines, you know, et cetera. Um, we can't read any of that in a string of data. So it becomes very important I, for me, certainly, to visualize these types of trends in order to make sense of what's going on. This is just information and feedback on what, what's going on out there in the network. And until such time as it becomes visual, I think for me and for a majority of people that I know, it, it becomes very challenging to get a read on, on the health of the, of the system. So this is, this is some data here from, from this, this case study. And we've got our four parameters here. Now we've got a couple of different locations left and right. Let's not worry about that too much just now. But you can see we've got four charts stacked one on top of the other. In the top, we've got chlorine. Second, we've got percent monochloramine. Third, free ammonia. And fourth, nitrite. There's other things we could add here, but it, these are often the core, core indicators. And if we just zoom in a little bit at the sort of nitrification period, nitrification, like, like all, all biological activity, like all chemical <laughs> chemistry as well, it's all very temperature driven. Our temperatures lead to faster metabolism, just like they lead to faster other aqueous reactions. So when we get into those warmer shoulder periods, fall periods, sometimes spring periods, where we have the combination of higher temperatures, but we don't quite have the demands to help turn over the network, that's sort of prime nitrification for most systems. If we look here at this data, you know, we look on the left, and this is more like a sort of baseline consideration. Let's looking at the bottom nitrite, which is often indicator number one, you know, we see a little bit of a rise here, not too much. Looking up now to free ammonia, I don't really see a lot of difference there relative to baseline. Um, monochloramine, still looking on the left, bit of a dip is noticeable. And on the total chlorine at the top left, again, a, a slight dip, but it's kind of hard to see that there's a lot going on there. Whereas if we look on the right, and again, taking it in reverse order from bottom to top, we can see a very distinct nitrite rise over time, coupled with what relative to baseline now becomes discernible as a dip in free ammonia corresponding to that. The monochloramine, which is, is, is low, and the total chlorine goes through a dip here as well. So we're seeing quite distinctly that the site on the right is really showing signs of, of nitrification. The site on, the site on the left is really showing very, very minor signs. So in terms of both how we monitor and how that plays into control, generally we set targets. We set targets for the point of entry, the distribution system, storage facilities. Sometimes where we have large networks, we get very different water age. We might have groupings within this. We might have low water age distribution system versus high water age ditto for storage facilities. And we, we set these sort of Boundaries. We might say, what are the values which are, which are, which are acceptable for us? What are we aiming for here? And uh, that sort of top half, bottom half of this is, is more sort of what sort of increase in markers um, do we have? Now, I've shown one, one number here just as an example, but in reality, we're going to have a, a few different numbers here. We're going to have a target number, something that we, uh, we like to stay within or below an operational limit, which is sort of a flag that we ought to start taking some sort of action to, to course correct those markers. And then there's a critical limit, which is where we are really seeing these numbers showing very clear indication of, of nitrification. So we can think of that as a sort of a green, amber, red type um, set of conditions. And we link the Operational limits, that's to say sort of yellow flag numbers and the critical limits, so those red flag numbers, we link those to escalating and defined operational responses. So that if these numbers happen, we're not huddling and, and, and pulling people in from engineering and operations and getting everyone together and saying, what do we do? We already have a sort of a roadmap 
of generally what we ought to be doing, and then it's about how we implement that. Um, this comes from the AWW um, notification manual and kind of shows all the different things that people, utilities have tried, trialed, and uh, the length of the bar sort of says the, 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 the popularity, if you like, how many utilities have tried that. Um, and the color coding says the, the perceived effectiveness by those utilities. So you can get a sense of what people do, how common these things are, and how effective they're deemed to be based on this. I would say uh, often these become something of the, the go-tos. I would say these are some of the more common for me personally, which is, of course, you know, raising up that residual and having a look at the ratios. Tank mixing is a big one. Um, because we can get a lot of dead spots in tanks. That's another conversation for another webinar. Um, modifying pH, I, I don't know if it's always as common. I personally have just dealt with some systems with trying to operate chloramines on some lower pHs and having a hard time with that. And I've highlighted this one because, you know, if we could watch this chloramination booster station one over time, I think we're going to see that bar sneak to the right as it becomes more popular. And that's because we're starting to see some suppliers come up with proprietary, uh, particularly in tank um, chloramine booster uh, equipment that comes with chlorine ammonia and a PLC with all the, the logic to manage that such that utilities can effectively choose a set point within the tank and it will, it will manage that. This was a tricky thing. We didn't really see much of that at all 20 years ago. Uh, we're seeing more and more of this, this now. So this is, these are some of the activities that might be linked to some of the, the yellow red flag type numbers. And that, that sort of takes us through what's been a bit, of a, a bit of a skip through a really big subject. There's so much more we could talk about, but um, I'd like to open it up and encourage any comments, any experiences, um, any questions, and uh, yeah, see if we can continue the conversation. So thank you for your attention. With that, I think we can open up for questions. Great. Thank you, Simon. Great topic today. We have a number of good questions here already, so let's get started with those. What is the effect of seasonal temperature and magnesium and manganese and iron changes on the effectiveness of chloramines? Of chloramines? Um, yeah, well, those I'll take those slightly separately because they are a little bit different. Um, on on temperature, um, temperature is very very implicated in nitrification. Um, where I am here north of the border, it's, it almost just becomes a seasonal issue that somewhat goes away in in the winter time. Uh, even systems that have quite aggressive nitrification through um, spring, summer, fall will generally see all of that die away. Over the winter, it's very driven, and that's just because temperature, as I very briefly mentioned, um, drives metabolic rates and reaction rates. So we get more bacteriological proliferation, and just innate, even you know, the the, nitri the nitrifiers aside, just the innate chloramine decay um, that we talked about that would occur in a beaker, independent of any pipe wall sort of biology, that was that will proceed at a faster rate. That reaction rate will approximately double for every ten degrees rise. Now that's me talking in Celsius. You'll have to convert that to Fahrenheit for those side of the border. And on manganese iron, yeah, there's some there's some the literature out there that talks about uh, particularly manganese in there. Um, generally with manganese, I think about manganese as being, you know, for systems that have uh, some slightly elevated manganese in the finished water or or grossly elevated manganese, these things will plate out over uh, they'll settle out or largely plate out and actually become trained within biofilms. And the main discoloration models we have now for how those two parameters um, participate in discoloration events used to be thought to be more of a gravity mechanism, now understood to be really uh, associated with their, um, with their being pulled into biofilms and concentrated within biofilms. And that hydraulic events, like summertime events, it's a warmer weather, so we get higher demands and higher shear force that comes with pipe seam flows they haven't seen for months. 
that strips away little layers of that pipe like an onion and releases all of that iron and manganese. So you can have a, a few things going on in the summer. Pipes get higher flows, strips off material off the pipe walls. That material contains iron and manganese that can directly interact with the chloramine. Um, it also sheds, uh, it can shed a little bit of biological demand, which increases that. And on top of all of that, you have, you have nitrification proceeding faster and chloramine decay proceeding faster. So there's a, there's a lot going on there uh, that, can, that can all happen in summer. Um, hope that, that answered the question. Thank you, Simon. Uh, next question is, how does ortho, or how does the addition of orthophosphate typically affect chloramine systems? Yeah, not, not a lot. It's, it's, it's always a question that comes up, and I've been part of those workshops where, you know, there's discussion of, of orthophosphate. So briefly, for those who might be less familiar, we sometimes add orthophosphate for um, corrosion control, almost always for lead control, and um, we're often adding that to anything up to one part as phosphate, as uh, phosphorus, pardon me. And um, the question sometimes comes up, well, if, if bacteria like carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and we start feeding additional phosphorus to the system, are we going to see a sort of proliferation of bacteria? And from what I've sort of read on this and seen on this, we, we don't seem to see uh, that a, a big, a very large impact. I think there are some case studies that will cite some, some growth, but it's, it's certainly not um, a sort of automatic, you know, it, it doesn't follow that the addition of orthophosphate is going to lead to a large proliferation of bacteria. And, 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 and nitrifiers in particular are much more preoccupied with, with ammonia and nitrite and carbon. Um, seem to be the major drivers there. So to my knowledge, there might be somebody out there who knows who knows more on this, uh, but to my knowledge, doesn't have a, a particularly notable impact on nitrification. Thank you. Do the compounds used to create the chloramines impact the rate of the reaction? So for example, gas versus hypo mixed with aqua versus ammonia sulfate. Yeah, good question. So there's, of course, just the fundamental impact on pH associated with those, which does have an impact. Um, so, you know, chlorine gas will depress the pH, hypo will raise the pH, um, ammonium hydroxide is going to raise the pH, ammonium sulfate is going to reduce the pH. So th there's that aspect. And of course, the degree to which it changes the pH is going to be a function of the buffering intensity of that water, which relates to both the, um, well, really the alkalinity and the and, and, the, and the pH, the pH plays into it as well. Um, so, you know, if the water has something like less than, um, this is real generalization stuff because we're picking a point on a curve here, but we might say something like if the pH is less than around 80 or 100 alkalinity, we might expect to see a bit of a bounce in pH both through, and of course it all depends on the dose that's been added for chlorination and so forth. So endless caveats to this, but if it's a lower alkalinity water, we might expect to see the pH bounce according to that. Um, there's another question is independent of pH, is there, some, is there something else going on? Not in the case of chlorine. Um, in the case of ammonia, there was a little bit of work that was done, uh, I'm aware of at University of Toronto looking at that. Um, I don't think they were able to identify anything too notable there. I think they found one system which the ammonium sulfate seemed to produce a slightly higher decay rate, but I don't think there was any satisfactory mechanistic sort of explanation. And I think it was a single set of tests. So again, to my knowledge, um, other than the pH effects, uh, no, not the, the choice of chemical doesn't really play out. Again, there might be some doubt there was some more up-to-date research than me on that, but to my knowledge, that's, that's how that works. Thank you. We've got five minutes left, so one more question. In the case of disinfection byproducts, so your DBPs, tank mixers and active ventilation help to dissipate the DBPs. How effective would that be with chloramines? So I, I presume this means if the water is carrying a load of 
So yeah, I'll maybe back up and briefly frame my understanding of what that question means. So even in the case of chloramines, we can still carry uh, DBPs, halogenated regulated DBPs. So in some cases, the we, if we're using chlorine for primary disinfection, so disinfection in the plant before it leaves the clear well, we're going to form disinfection byproducts there. Um, halogenated regulated, you know, THMs, HAs. Once we add the ammonia, that reaction is effectively quenched, but whatever's formed has formed and will be in the water. And so can we use aeration? Um, you know, if we still see, you know, seasonal peaks in those, can we still use aeration? Well, the answer there would be yes, for the volatile fractions we continue to come off our respective chloramines. So we could still strip out, you know, um, the trihalomethanes in the same way, it wouldn't, wouldn't really impact that. But haloacetic acids are they are not amenable to to aeration volatilization. They're just not very volatile at all, so it have no impact on on those. Great, thanks, Simon. And with that, we're going to wrap it up today. Thank you for all your participation. If you have any other questions for Simon, his contact info is in the chat noted below. You'll receive an email shortly with a link to download your participation certificate. We will also be posting this presentation, and I know a few of you have asked, on stantech.com if you'd like to listen again as well as share with your colleagues. Our next presentation will be on Monday, May 1st, where our panel will be talking about the impacts of the new PFAS maximum contaminant levels and what can be done. We hope you can join us again soon. Thank you.